This is a little tutorial to show you how I make my one-page sketchbooks. For this one, I used a Canson XL watercolor paper in 9x12. I'm using a Derwent Graphitone water-soluble pencil. It's 8B, and mine broke, so I needed to stick it into a pencil extender to give me a little more space. Then I have a watercolor palette that I filled with a variety of high quality watercolors. And I have two um, 18 gauge fine liner pens that I have filled with uh, golden fluid acrylics in black and white. These are really cool because they have a needle that prevents the tip from clogging. And you can make some really cool marks uh, dots and lines and and draw with them. So I'm going to start by drawing with the Derwent Graphitone pencil and I'm just making really fluid marks. Um, I want to fill up the page and just make some interesting shapes. Um, so that's what I'm doing here trying to draw from my shoulder instead of with my wrist to keep things really fluid. And then when I'm done with this, I am going to take a watercolor brush and I'm going to activate the lines and you can see that here. It turns out really cool. I really like the gray um, thick line that it produces kind of uh, gives a shadow to the line. The brush that I'm using is a uh, Kalinsky Sable brush, and if you're a watercolor artist, I highly recommend buying at least one. These hold so much water, and they are just a, a joy to work with. If you get a good one, it will hold a really fine tip and you can make all kinds of marks with it. Um, so it's really great if you're trying to fill up a big area, if you're trying to make very fine marks. You can do just about anything with a good Kalinsky Sable watercolor brush. They are not cheap though, I will say that. So, you know, you want to take good care of it, not leave it sitting in water, um, protect that tip. So here we go, we're activating all those beautiful lines. Um, almost done, and there we go. So I've let that dry, and now I'm gonna show you the watercolors that I plan to use. I have uh, Lunar Blue from Daniel Smith, uh, Holbein Horizon, uh, Vermilion Hue from Holbein, Deep Scarlet from Daniel Smith, uh, Hansa Yellow Deep, and Aussie Gold from Daniel Smith as well. So now I'm going to start filling in the shapes that I find interesting. And I do try and repeat the colors that I'm using, but also vary them with just a, a touch of another color. And the fact that I've used a limited palette will help unify the book and make it look like all one piece. Another thing that I do is, uh, you know, I keep a little bit of a messy palette and have puddles of various colors all over. And you don't need to wipe your palette down every time you do a painting. You can just dip back into those colors and kind of modify the ones that you're working with in your current painting and just make them a little bit more interesting. So I'm just working my way around the painting, trying to put red in each quadrant of the painting so that it will appear in each spread of the book and I am trying to make them all just slightly different so that they're a little bit interesting but they're all in the same family because I'm again using a limited color palette. 
I noticed as I was filling in the yellow shape that I had a little bit of a red blob sticking out of the shape beside it and it kind of bothered me at first but I decided to go with it and I reactivated it with some water and spread it around and it ended up being kind of one of those happy little accidents that Bob Ross talks about. Um, I actually kind of like it now, the little bit of a bleed there. And now I'm putting in some of the Lunar Blue. Um, lunar Blue is a blue that has iron oxide in it, so it makes a really beautiful granulation when it dries. In this shape, I am adding a little variety. I started out with Horizon Blue at the beginning, then I added in some Lunar Blue just to give it a little more um, variety and interest. Now I'm working on a section with the Aussie Red Gold by Daniel Smith. This is one of my favorite yellows. It is a mixture, not a pure one color paint. Uh, so it doesn't always play well with other colors. It's not great for making greens and things, but um, it has just a vibrance to it and kind of an earthy, warm gold without actually being gold and shiny. And it really reminds me of the quinacridone nickel azo gold by Golden Fluid Acrylics. In this little space, I did mix the Aussie red gold and the lunar blue together, and I got kind of a muddy uh, green. It's It does make a good neutral, and I'm going to go ahead and keep it there because um, neutrals really help your more uh, pure colors to pop. So it's always a good idea to include neutrals in your paintings, even if you want a very bright and vibrant painting. At this point, I'm going to take a break from watercolor and switch to some line work. These are Faber-Castell pit pens in a variety of nibs and sizes. I like the soft chisel especially, and the 1.5, the medium, and the extra small nibs for doing my line work. And I'm just going to start by filling in with some repeating lines. This is a motif that I really like, and I'm just going to go around and try and fill up different areas, spread it out so that again it appears in each spread of the book. I sped this video up times two uh, in real life. I took my time and I went kind of slow. My lines are not always straight. They're often a little bit wobbly and I'm okay with that. Um, sometimes they're not evenly spaced and it's just kind of a recording of my day and how things are at the moment. And I've kind of gotten more comfortable with that. Um, when you make things by hand, they're not going to be perfect. It's not something made by machine. And that's okay. That's, that's a recording of you and your day and your energy and your hand. And I kind of like that now. Now I'm going to use a Posca pen with a bullet tip. And it's... Uh, the biggest marker that they make, I believe, but it makes some really nice um, big dots, and that's what I typically use it for. Sometimes I'll use it for lines as well, but those dots are juicy. And then I'm going to take my fine liner, and I'm going to use that to make some other smaller dots. The thing I like about using this um, is it when it dries, it makes a wonderful texture. It's kind of like braille, so it adds another dimension to the book. These take a little while to dry though, so you need to let them sit and be very aware of not sticking your hand in them. I have done that. Now I'm using the white fine liner to make some kind of swish marks. 
Uh, they will also be textured, and that's kind of fun if you're sharing this book with children. They do like to rub their fingers over the texture. I'm using watercolor to add some more stripes. And just going around putting stripes in various locations. So the working motif is stripes and dots. If you have an interest in any of these products that I'm using, I will stick uh, links in the comments below the video and you can check them out. So I'm just gonna wrap this up with a few more stripes and then I'm gonna show you how to cut the book apart and fold it. So we turn it over and I'm gonna mark the center line with a pencil. Just to use a few little tick marks to get myself in the right spot. You can do this by folding, but I have found that the Canson XL paper doesn't really fold very well the long way. Um, it tends to kind of mangle the paper, and I don't really like to fold that particular fold. But I am going to start by folding it uh, across the short way down the center. Then I'm going to reverse that fold. And I'm using a bone folder to flatten it. And then I'm going to fold in each of the sides so that I have four smaller sections. And again, using the bone folder to kind of flatten it out. You can use a spoon or uh, something else that's hard. And then I'm going to mark for you where I'm going to stop my cut. I'm using scissors. Normally I use a knife, um, but I figured most people have scissors in the home at least and may not have a sharp knife. I'm going to stop right at that mark and then I'm going to fold along the line that I had created with the pencil. And now I have my little accordion fold booklet. And I'm just looking through to see which direction I want to use it. And I think I'm going to go with this direction. At this point, I'm just going to look at each spread individually and try and uh, make it its own painting. Uh, I'm using my pens again and might add some more watercolor. But now I'm treating it as individual um, paintings, four little individual paintings. They are also connected, so you end up with two long paintings as well, but really I want it to be viewed as these spreads. So I'm putting in more watercolor. I don't normally do realistic paintings or um, add recognizable things. I tend to lean more towards the abstract, but with these little books I find um, it's kind of fun to add the whimsical elements. So I'm going to put a little house in this spread and I'll probably add a few other things that are semi-recognizable, um, landscape-ish or something. And now I'm using my uh, fine liner to make some implied clouds. Um, a few more stripes with the pit pen. But I'm not going to fill up this shape entirely. More of those lovely textural dots. And again, I'm not filling the shape entirely. And now I'm adding some kind of stone shapes. In uh, I'm using a Signo white gel pen. These are really good. They are not um, safe if you're going to use water over the top of them, but they do make a really nice fine white line. And then I'm going to put in some darker watercolor uh, to kind of accentuate those shapes and to make them more stone-like. Alright, here I am using a flat brush to put in some 
kind of square marks. Uh, this is another kind of mark making that I like to do in my paintings. I am going off the edge of the paper a little bit and then I'm going to go right up to the line uh, to make it look like it's maybe going behind the blue shape. And then I'm going to use the same brush to make some kind of swoosh marks, sort of the same color. And now I'm using the flat brush to make some lines that grow in length. And then I decided I would maybe put in some little people shapes. Um, I'm going to put in a, maybe an adult sized person and then uh, a little child sized person. And I'm going to fill in the details with this pencil. Um, they have legs and they have a head, but no arms for some reason. And then. I'm going to use the fine liner to make some more of those black swoosh marks. And then these little people are getting rained on for some reason. It's really hot where I am right now, over 100, and rain sounds good right now, as long as it's a cool rain. Right here I'm using a Posca pen in a smaller size to, in white to make dots into the black uh, dots. And then I decided I wanted a little more substance underneath my little people. It looked like they were kind of floating. Um, so I decided to fill in with some kind of deeper green and I definitely used thalo green in that color. And since I used it on the first spread, I decided I probably should use it somewhere else. Um, the repetition definitely helps unify the book. So my brush was already loaded and I just used it somewhere else. And then uh, just kind of filling in some details to add interest. I've got some of that quinacridone or uh, Aussie gold and I'm gonna do a couple more touches of that color. And then I decided to go over uh, some of these colors with a little bit of colored pencil. Um, back to my dots with the fine liner. Those are always a fun accent. So I guess the question comes eventually, how do you know when you're finished? And I would say it's probably an experienced thing. Um, everybody has a certain tolerance for busyness and how much is enough and in my case I, I kind of just get a feel for it so I just keep adding details until I feel like it's done and, and that's not really a great answer if you're someone else trying to figure it out but um, I've kind of gotten the feel for when the details make me happy and when they start to make me feel a little bit anxious. So I decided I needed a little more implication of the whimsy and the, um, the adventure, so I put in a little sun with some of the fine liner. I feel like it's getting close and just adding some watercolor. Um, and I'm, in this case, trying to make it kind of fade out on the edges and also uh, separate a little bit. Um, so I'm doing that on both sides. And then I'm going to come in with a little more intense color using colored pencil, um, just to give a little shading in certain areas, uh, a little more intensity. So I'm using, uh, I think they're Barrel Prismacolor pencils. I have a variety of stuff I've collected over the years, so I'm not 100% sure. But 
I'm just layering, um, you know, different directions and uh, different intensities of color to kind of make it shaded. So I'm using the pencil to also clean up a little bit of a ragged edge along the watercolor and then I'm going to use it to maybe intensify some of the yellow and then I feel like it's done. So it's ready. I'm ready to make the covers and I'm using a board that I took off of the back of a Canson XL pad of paper. It is just the right size to make the covers and I measured uh, the exact same size as my pages and I am just going over and over it with uh, a Stanley knife um, and then I'm going to cut the individual boards, one for each side. Make sure your knife is really sharp for this. Um, you're going to have to drag it through there multiple times to cut that board. It is super thick. Um, so don't try and do this with a dull knife. So I just got some fabric that I liked from Joann's. This is cotton canvas. And then I'm using as my adhesive gloss gel. And I have a palette knife and my two boards. And I'm going to lay out my fabric um, backside up. And then I am going to place my boards approximately where I want them. You're going to need a margin of about uh, three quarters to an inch around each board to fold over and bind the edge. And then I'm going to take some of that um, gel medium and just slather it on. Uh, to cover every bit of the back of this board and then I'm going to scrape it off so there's just a very thin layer so I'm just getting right up to the edges now I used gloss gel medium mainly because I had it I'm sure there's better adhesives for this project but I didn't have them so I'm just using what I have um, matte medium might work as well. I would say something that's super wet is not going to look great. It's going to seep through the fabric and that might not be a good thing, but uh, the gel is, is pretty thick and kind of um, dry feeling, so it doesn't really penetrate through to the other side of the fabric. So I'm doing that with both boards. and. And I'm just going to lay the sticky side down onto the fabric. And once I do that, almost there, just removing all of the excess, I'm going to lay a piece of wax paper over the top. And then I am going to put a heavy weight on top. And in this case, it is, there's my wax paper, it is a dictionary that I have that is probably 8 inches thick and super heavy. Now my boards are dried to the fabric and I'm just going to cut off the corners. I've already trimmed the edges mostly. And then I'm going to use the same gloss gel. And I'm just going to slather it on the edges. And then I'm folding the edges of the fabric down. I am by no means an expert at doing this. There are probably better instructional videos for this particular part of it. Um, but this is the method I used and it's what has worked for me. So there you go. Now the one thing that I have had some problems with is the corners and I will show you how I deal with that. Um, I did try a different method where you fold the corners in first and then fold the sides and I just ended up with too much bulk and I didn't really like that. So 
this seems to be less bulky and and it seems to work okay. So I've just taken off the excess and you can see there's an awful lot of fiddling to try and get these things to lay flat and not stick to my fingers and trying to get the corners in. Then I'm going to put the dictionary on top of both of these boards and let them dry. And I cut pieces of wax paper to put between each of the spreads because I don't want the acrylic to stick to the opposite page. So that's kind of an important step. Now I've got my boards dry. I'm going to wrap the book in wax paper and just leave the two outside flaps uh, exposed. I'm going to trim off those little bits of fabric that were giving me trouble. Just give it a little trim with my good scissors. And then I am going to put some more of that gel medium on each of the boards. This time just slightly thicker um, because I want it to make contact with the pages nicely. And again, going right up to the edges because I don't want to have the paper um, kind of loose and not sticking. So carefully coating each board and lay down a piece of wax paper so nothing sticks and then I take my little book and I position the board on the back side and get it nicely lined up and then I got something holding it down and I'll do the same procedure with the other board. Just frosting my gel medium onto the board. So when I'm done with all that, I'm gonna carefully line everything up and uh, put another piece of wax paper down so that nothing sticks to anything else that it's not supposed to. And then I'm going to put my weight back down, my dictionary, and let it sit for a few hours to dry. My book is dry, and now it's time for a little walkthrough. I'm going to remove the wax paper, but when I'm storing it, I will put that back in there. Uh, because if it gets hot, the, the acrylics will stick to the opposite page and ruin your book. So here we go, uh, walking through four spreads. And then you can extend it to kind of see the longer view. On each side. And then if you want to get fancy, you can open up the book again to be one whole page and kind of see where you came from. And it's kind of cool to see um, the different views that you can get from the same book. Now you could glue that one folded piece together, but I actually prefer to have the versatility of the book the way it is.